sponsored by Logboat Brewing. Uh, we haven't got to do this properly for a while, so we're really excited. So it's a big hand. The only scholarly talk series sponsored by a brewery in, in the world, as far as I know, and someone can uh, correct me on that. Uh, you know, I hope it's, uh, hope it's a trend, actually, maybe that we start. But I don't know that it is. Uh, uh, so I think we still might be unique that. Uh, those of you out for those, and so if you're here in person, please join us for a Pursuit of Happiness Hour after the talk. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube or Facebook, just pop open a nice log boat uh, if you can, or it's sometimes. Uh, sorry, I'm saying like a Vince Cully advertising hot dogs at the ball. <laughs> I can do that. Throw in throw in various products as we mentioned, as 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 they come up. Anyway, for those of you watching on uh, the live stream, uh, I'm uh, Jeff Pasley, associate director of the Kinder Institute, professor of history here at the University of Missouri. Uh, I think a lot of people are excited about today's talk, so I thought I would throw in something that we don't do every time, we do sometimes which is a little statement that I have about what uh, the Kinder Institute is. A failed science experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Founded in 2014. Uh, the Kinder Institute is a joint project between the University of Missouri History and Political Science Departments and the College of Arts and Science in cooperation with other scholars across the campus. Uh, we work with actually all kinds of people. Uh, Department of uh, uh, the Law School, Department of Black Studies, to being two particular two particular ones that we've done a lot. Uh, it's dedicated to research, teaching, and community engagement on the subject of American political thought and history, seen in a broad global context and from a wide variety of perspectives. Our goal is to prepare students for the future of American democracy and Missouri democracy, such as they might be, uh, by equipping them uh, with knowledge of its past, uh, and I should say, uh, honest knowledge of its past. Our hope at the Kinder Institute is to teach and learn about American, American constitutional democracy as the founders created it or had it created uh, under them uh, or around them, uh, but not just that. We want to understand the ideas that inspired the founders as well as those they disagreed with and over. We want to understand our republic's shortcomings as well as its accomplishments, the changes it has gone through as well as its eternal truth, truce. Uh, and now back to our regularly scheduled program. Uh, our guest today is published for me as one of the, mo one of the most exciting uh, books published in the past year. Uh, now, most people probably wouldn't get excited about a 745-page book uh, about, about uh, <laughs> politics in the early republic, but I thought it was. The First Reconstruction, Black Politics in America from the Revolution to the Civil War by today's guest, uh, Van Goss. Uh, Admittedly, you might have to justify saying you might have to justify qualify that by saying it's the most by saying it's the most exciting work in the history in the in the in the field of the of the uh, early republic. But uh, I think it has so many more implications than that, actually, as you'll see. Uh, and and in terms of excitement, this is why historians get this is the kind of thing historians get excited about. That even those of us who literally can correct the spelling of members of Congress from 1819. Uh, off the top of their head, off the top of their head, who can like, uh, like probably name, you know, probably name like, uh, uh, like a hundred. Well, I don't even. Don't, I don't even want to get into what I can do <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of things that I just have in my head. But Van uh, managed to find some things that not just me, but a, lo a whole lot of uh, people who are just up to their, up to above their ears and eyeballs in this topic, uh, in the topic of politics in the republic. It just Written, barely heard of, didn't know about it all, uh, were, was a shocking newsflash from the past, and that it's always so wonderful to see because sometimes you feel like there can't be one, uh, but it turns out there is, uh, and that's what we're going to hear about today. Van Goss is professor of history at Franklin and Marshall University in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He's a prolific activist and writer in addition to his scholarly work, uh, and I see that this introduction thing I wrote actually... Uh, didn't update from what I, from so I'll just do this off the top of my head. Among other things, he's the founder of uh, Historians Against the War, which is a very prominent organization. It's a different name now, but it was a very prominent organization uh, 20 years ago during the uh, during the time of the, of the controversies over the Iraq War uh, that many of us remember very well. Uh, and that's he's also written just an incredible number of articles, both popular and scholarly 
uh, many of which he's got very conveniently up on his website, vangoss.com, which uh, especially it's a lot of things that are hard to find, a lot of they're hard to get to, chap book chapters and things like that. So I recommend that to your attention. Uh, Van was educated at Rutgers University and Columbia University, and he's very unusual in having moved from very recent history to early American history. I've seen a lot of people do that in the other way or other way around. Uh, some 20th century people go back and try to you know, make a little money off the founders every once in a while. Uh, it's very unusual to see someone to go from the 20s to actually pursue an actual research interest from the 20th century back into the 18th, uh, as though they'd been there the whole time. Um, before he got into what he's doing now, Van was a path-breaking scholar of the history of the New Left, uh, pushing beyond radical memoirs of the 60s to the actual history of multiracial left-wing movements going back to the 1950s and beyond. In other words, uh, and this is something I spent a long time last night talking to Van about this, so I guess my summary is it did not start with Jane Fonda's future husband in the Port Huron saving folks <laughs> at all. Uh, he's got a book which I plan to be reading soon called Where the, Bo Where the Boys Are, uh, Cu Cuba, Cold War, Cold War America, and the Making of the New Left, as well as uh, Rethinking the New Left and Interpretative History, the Movements of the New Left, a brief history with documents, uh, in the Little Bed Bedford book series, and the world the 60s made, uh, politics uh, and culture in recent America. Uh, so now Van has turned, and with great profit to us, great turn to the early republic. Uh, he's written a whole bunch of other articles before this book came out and edited with David Wallstreicher, uh, Re Revolutions and Reconstructions, Black Politics in the Long 19th Century that was published last year. Uh, but I am going to stop talking and let, uh, Van, give, let, give, let Van Goss take over. Thank you. It's got only lots of post-it notes. It's the cover that I'm going to get to. The cover, there we go. <laughs> Uh, well, this is an honor for me. Thank you very much. I had a great uh, lunchtime meeting with, with undergraduate fellows who seemed like PhD students to me, <laughs> PhD students. So this is very exciting. And I admit, I don't get to the Midwest very much. Um, it may be that Central Pennsylvania has a lot in common with the Midwest, but really out here, this is a, you know a foreign trip for me, and which of course suggests something about my view of the U.S. that it's not really a nation. It's kind of a big sprawling conglomeration that pretends to be one. Um, so this talk, I'm going to talk quite a bit about historiography, the history of history, not because I'm so focused on my discipline, but because it isn't strictly academic. It really matters who and what gets taken in or out of the books we write. It matters for historians because historians treat that as kind of obiter dicta, like this is the history and I must know this, and that frames it. And that could be very limiting. So sometimes, Jeff's done this, the people I know, you try to break through and say, here's something new. Um, so I'm going to begin with what I call, it's not in the book, but I, this came up when I was trying to explain it, what I call the great fallacy of the founding of American politics. And this gets repeated especially by liberals because they're seeking a narrative of progress. Things just got better and better, and then we got to Barack Obama. It's always getting better. Right now, that doesn't seem quite so valid, right? Um, so the pro it goes like this, and I remember seeing this. I mean, you know, some liberal pundit, the nation. I'm not anti-liberal. I'm just further to their left, okay? So, and you'll see this in the Nation magazine, or the New Republic, or the Atlantic. At the founding, only propertyed white men could vote. It's a bunch of hooey. Not a single part of that statement is true. Let me show you what I mean. Pick this off the floor. <laughs> only propertyed white men could vote. No. In New Jersey, from 1776 to 1807, women could vote. And they did vote. And this was not an accident or an anomaly or a mistake. It was a conscious decision that inhabitants with a 50 pound, that's uh, cheap revolution money, could vote. So if a woman was a widow or she'd never married, as long as she could establish her independence, she did vote. Even black women voted. Because we know that periodically some Republican, Jeffersonian, would go, oh my god, that state senate race was decided by two colored women. So they voted. Women could vote. It was actually not an impossible construct. Okay? Property. This is deeply held. This has um, a great significance for the people who still believe that the Democratic Party of Andrew Jackson is the party of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and somehow the party of Joe Biden, right? That there was a great increase of democracy because of getting rid of the property suffrage. Complete hooey. 
at least five states, the founding 13, had taxpayer suffrage, which is to say nothing. Taxpayer suffrage isn't property suffrage. It was almost, you know, Massachusetts meant if you owned some tools, you could vote, okay? So taxpayer suffrage, no. Yes, in some states, not in others. Some of the, some of the major, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, only white men could vote. Okay, now I'm gonna make an illusion. This is, I got this from Eric Fono. In 1857, nearby, in Illinois, in Springfield, a lawyer, a corporate railroad lawyer, you know where I'm going, he had a speech against Dred Scott. He was a very good lawyer. Now, Dred Scott is morally abominable, but beyond that, it's the worst decision in American history because it is such bad law. It has absolutely no basis in the law of this country. Abraham Lincoln got up and said, he quoted Justice Benjamin Curtis's dissent. And remember, they didn't have Google then. They couldn't go on Hathi Trust and find every constitutional thing. Justice Curtis was being careful. Justice Curtis said, Lincoln quoted him, that in five of the original 13 colored men voted in the ratification of the Constitution. There is no more foundational vote than to vote to ratify the US Constitution. That's a founding vote. But Lincoln got it wrong. Justice Curtis got it wrong because they don't have the easy access we do to Hathi Trust, okay? It was 10 of the 13. Only three, the original 13, had a racial qualification for suffrage. Not surprisingly, Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia, right? The other ones didn't. Now let me just say, Sue, and I'm looking at political scientists, the primary disqualification in colonial British America was religious because these were British colonies. Protestant country for a Protestant people. So Catholics and Jews not vote. The anecdote that I like to illustrate this was, guess how late it was before New Hampshire got rid of its prohibition on anyone other than Protestants holding office? The 1880s. John Jay, who is you know, a heroic figure in my account, right? John Jay tried really hard to put a bar on Catholics doing anything into New York's original constitution. They stopped him on that, but they, they got quite a bit in there. So, and there were free black men, not huge numbers, but they were there. And given what the populations in these counties, these states were, if there was one in a town of 300 or five or whatever, you knew who they were. And you knew if they were voting. So 10 of the 13. So the notion of some kind of organic whiteness to American politics is deeply, deeply wrong. So that's my starting point. That's what I call <clears throat> the great fallacy. <clears throat> the premise of my book all 745 pages, <laughs> is that black men voted and engaged in party and partisan politics, often in many places at every point between 1790 and 1860, and that it mattered. So why does, it, um, why does this matter? Well, in the most prosaic sense, as I document in enormous detail, because I have to make sure that people can't say, oh, you just made this up, or I don't know, you listed 15 different things in your footnote, but I'm not going to go look at them. Well, I'm going to show you what they are so you can't pretend it didn't happen, OK? Sometimes it mattered because they had enough votes to swing an election. And that is a common charge. And we're talking you know, vastly smaller electorates. So 100, 200, 500, 600 votes, sometimes a few thousand, really could matter. And that, I mean, I document where they were, it was charged that they had. Now, I know, and I'm looking, because I know there's political scientists, the whole idea of a particular group swinging an election doesn't actually bear logical measure, in account, but it doesn't matter for an historian. What matters is that people thought they had, that a block vote in New York in 1849 did deliver the whole state of New York to Whigs. It really mattered, especially if it's published in a newspaper with a larger readership than anything today, anything we can think of, the New York Herald, okay? So, it, you know, it was perceived that they were swinging elections. Well, that always matters. We always should pay attention to that. Maybe even more, slaveholders and their allies noticed it all the time and everywhere. And much of my evidence is derived from Southern or Democratic newspapers, little difference, to be honest, in those days, pro-slavery newspapers saying, look, look, look who's letting those black men vote. Usually they're partisan enemies, Federalists, National Republicans, Whigs, Liberty Men, Free Soilers, Republicans. Usually that's who's letting black men vote. It's noticed all the time. Articles are reprinted. Journalists of the press help me a lot here. All over the South, in leading Southern newspapers, that black men are not just voting, they're going to meetings, they're holding meetings. So if the slaveholders notice, we should too. Because it was, in fact, a standing rebuke to their notion of what America should be that black men were voting. 
in politicking, in being seen on platforms with leading white politicians. So I think finally it matters because it should change how we see the past, literally. Whom in your mind's eye do you see approaching the poll? Now the poll in a Pennsylvania county 200 years ago, the poll is a window in somebody's house. That's what it is. You're gonna put a paper in through the window. Who gave you which paper? You know, was it that blue paper for the Whigs or was it that whatever it is, orange paper for the Democrats? You're gonna take one from someone, you're gonna walk up and be seen putting it in. So who do you see putting in that paper? you know, in Bucks County in 1837, or Syracuse in 1858, or Cleveland in 1849, or New Bedford in 1833, or near where I live in Lower Manhattan in 1807, where you would have seen them by the hundreds going up to put the paper in, brought by the Federalists. So um, now, so the question then becomes, why has this been so completely ignored until now? Because it would raise a question of, if in 2021 it's been ignored, I mean, is, did it really happen? Or why was it ignored? So my best theory is an un thoroughly unconscious collaboration between the liberal camp of historians and the radical camp of historians. Let's be clear, there is no such thing as a conservative as in right wing. There is no such thing. The liberals, OK? I mean, I'm just talking loosely here, OK? The liberals are could be boiled down to originally Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. You know, advisor to President Kennedy, Age of Jackson, a book read by really large numbers of Americans that defined the mid 20th century Democratic Party as the Jackson, F, Jefferson Jackson FDR party. So, you know, and Schlesinger's inheritor, which is Sean Wilentz of Princeton, for sure, in his book, The Rise of American Democracy, in 2006. Sean is a definitive historian. Those are the liberal historians, okay? Um, for them, not noticing black men voting, not noticing that there's such a thing, allows them to think of what we now call the white republic, this idea of a white, as somehow regrettable. Schlesinger, frankly, didn't seem to care much one way or the other. He thought abolitionists were pests, you know, gadflies, sort of messing things up. Um, either black politics um, uh, is, is extraneous. Whiteness, let me, let me be clear about this. It's not to be welcomed. It's to be accepted as natural. So liberal historians say, well, that's the way it was then. People didn't realize the enormity of human enslavement. It was natural. Of course, only white men voted because that was just the way things were. So it suits them to ignore black politics. It suits the radical historians, people like Alexander Saxton in The, the, the White Republic, a very influential book, or Dave Rodiger in The Wages of Whiteness. And there's a whole many people who followed in their wake in the past 30 plus years to say, that's right. It was always a monolithically white republic, and that's the nature of this country, and you better accept it. I think they're both wrong. The white republic is quite real. That should be really clear right now. It has always been challenged. It is not a totalizing monolithic fact. It has always been challenged by black men and significant white allies. Now, whether they're a majority in a particular place or not, but when you're talking about Jay, or William Seward, or Thaddeus Stevens, or Salmon P. Chase, or any number of other leading political figures who explicitly and openly didn't just abjure slavery, but embraced a non-racial idea of Americanism, then you have to acknowledge that the white republic was challenged, that it was a project, that's what I would call it, a political project, to say this was always a community of white men exclusively. That's Justice Taney and Dred Scott, and many other declarations in those days. So um, this is, you know, the white republic is convenient for different groups of historians, but I think it's more complex. And my book is about challenging that idea and saying, well, there's this political project. It's very powerful. The Jeffersonian Republican, Jackson Democratic Party, essentially the same thing. It's very dominant, very powerful, but it is not unchallenged. So, um, and everyone knew back then that it mattered. That slaveholders, as I pointed out, paid huge attention. Because the fact of black voting suggests citizenship, real citizenship. There's no such thing as second class citizenship. That's an oxymoron. It suggested black citizenship, and that is a rebuke to the legitimacy of slaveholding and to the southern way of life, if you want. So um, now, historians have, in a, in a very strange, indirect, and backwards fashion, sort of acknowledged some of the history that I'm describing. Um, what they've done 
almost entirely, is focused on disfranchisement, racial disfranchisement, the disfranchisement of black voters, as if all that was all that mattered. Well, if they, as if they weren't voting in the first place. You don't disfranchise someone who's not voting. You disfranchise them because they're voting. Right? Huh? Otherwise, why would you bother? Why go to the trouble? So somehow the fact that they were voting slipped the attention, not to sound contemptuous or superior, of all these historians. Um, the net result is to make black men's participation in northern politics the politics because two of the states where they were voting until the mid-1830s were Tennessee and North Carolina with distinct electorates. I just mentioned that. Um, it makes their, their presence non-existent or irrelevant. Um, here, there's a particular book that's key by Leon Litwack, one of the great historians of the past 70 years. And you know, I stand back respectfully because you know, to write a book like North of Slavery in 18, 1961 when American historians didn't pay any attention to slavery, let alone free people of color in the North. So he broke the ground there with North of Slavery in 1961. We still read it. It's still foundational. But in that book, he asserted that the number of black men who could vote in New England, where they were, at, there was never any question that they were, the franchise was non-racial in New England or part of New England. He said, well, there's so few, it just doesn't matter. He said, it's, it's hardly any free black people in New England. There's so few, it's, it's infinitesimal. If you play out his numbers, it looks like about 1,200 men in all of New England. That's a very small number. And that book has been cited. It's probably going to get cited this year by someone as, as like, well, that's all you need to know. And I'm, you know, I, I respect Leon Litwack as one of the great historians. I understand why he said that. He was, in fact, pushing, trying to let people know that the North, the North was not you know, guilt-free. But that's been taken because this historians are very conservative about what somebody else has proven once they've proven it. It's like the Supreme Court and stare decisis. That's it. It's been proven. Now, I want to quickly, I want to give credit where credit is due. I am not the first historian who has written about black men participating in traditional party politics. There is a small number of books. Looking at the list, I noted a surprising number of women authors, you know, given the field of political history, which may say something. In 1982, Phyllis Field published an extraordinary book, The Politics of Race in New York, The Struggle for Black Suffrage in the Civil War Era. The same year, Robert J. Cottrell published The Afro-Yankees, Providence's Black Community in the Antebellum Era. In many ways, these are the things that got me to write this book. I had no idea I was going to write. Um, in 1989, William and Amy Lee Cheek published John Mercer Langston in the Fight for Black Freedom in 1829, 1865. It's about Ohio. In 2001, Catherine Grover brought out The Fugitives, Gibraltar, Escaping Slaves and Abolitionism in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And in 2012, my friend Steve Kantrowitz published More Than Freedom, Fighting for Black Citizenship in a White Republic, 1829-1889, which is about Boston. So, um, so there were there was you know a small but very solid historiography that I could build on. I don't want to sound like I thought I invented everything here, but and go beyond. Um, I want to note though that it is really telling that anybody investigating this field is still going to rely on a master's thesis from the University of Wisconsin in 1912. Emil Ulbricht's The Development of Sentiment on Negro Suffrage to 1860, 1912, actually done in 1906. That tells you something about how ignored this was. So my book is primarily a series of case studies. And I'm going to outline these here and um, of, of cities or states or you know particular places. Um, and at this point, I will just say, in this period of American history, to, to look at politics on a national, let alone even regional level, I think is fundamentally mistaken. The states are so sovereign, so distinct in terms of their constitutional uh, rules, um, extraordinarily varied, their political cultures, that politics mostly happens in the states. I regard the federal state as a kind of possession to be grabbed onto for certain purposes, um, mainly to um, expand the reach of slavery. The Jeffersonian and Democratic parties exist and dominate mostly in this 70 years so as to allow the, the seaboard slaveholding states to expand to and beyond the Mississippi through you know, wars of extraordinary conquest and violence. That's Adam Rothman's work, as you know. Um, that's, you know, or the North gets a hold of it and says tariffs. The federal government is so small, and many, if not most, really serious politicians focus on their states. That's where it matters, that's where the patronage is. I don't mean to overstate it, but I'm pretty good. So Matt, you know, that's where, what I'm going to focus on is where it's actually happening in the states. 
Um, so I have a chapter briefly I will mention, but only one that looks at the whole, the whole Megillah on the ideology of black republicanism before the Civil War, which is obviously an allusion to Eric Foner's extraordinary free labor, free soil, free men, the ideology of the Republican Party before the Civil War. So I'm you know, paying homage there. Um, and I do argue that there is a vernacular black republicanism premised on, and I want to just mention this to be clear, the, the politics of these men are. It's the one thing they share from way up in Maine out to, well, basically out to Ohio, because the rest of the Midwest is not welcoming, and the majority of free black people are in Ohio in 1860, by the way, so that's where they are. Um, the thing they really do share when they meet in national conventions is an ideology perspective. Um, it, the, it can be summed up in three words. We are Americans. As the original title of the book was something they said over and over and over. And in fact, I quote a really key address by Frederick Douglass one year after the famous What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, which is quoted endlessly as a great speech. I don't think it's a representative speech. It's a speech to white people, make them feel bad and shock them. And when he was speaking at a national convention a year later, he said, again, they said, again, we are Americans, just like you, except for this accident of complexion, the word they and their white allies are preferred. As far back as Benjamin Franklin, complexion, not color and race, complexion, which as we all know, can vary with climate, with appetite, with disease. So what does it mean to say we are Americans? First, it's premised on the Anglo-American conception of birthright subjectship, which becomes citizenship, which is the distinctive feature of the political order that we inherited. The Congress declares every inhabitant an American citizen, by the way. At the beginning of the revolution, that definitely included free black people. There's never any question, as far as I can see. So birthright, and you know, by this point, we're talking about people who've been birthright for three or four or five generations. And they talked about that a lot. Think about why they would talk about that a lot, especially once you get to the 1840s. Who was born here? Orthodox Protestantism. Free black people, Methodists and Baptists, a lot of their leaders are Congregationalists and Presbyterians. So they're grabbing on hold onto the mains, the cultural anchor of American society, Orthodox Protestantism. <laughs> Military service, which is very opportunistic because as an article of mine shows, most, you know, larger numbers of black men fought for England in two wars, right? <laughs> but they claimed as much every way they could. And here they had a special little gimme, if you want, which was Andrew Jackson speech to his black soldiers after the Battle of New Orleans. The single most quoted black text was to quote Andrew Jackson. Can you imagine digging the Democrats with this saying, referring to his black troops, who were mostly you know, from, they had nothing in common with three black men in Philadelphia and New York, but they were black, and saying, calling them fellow citizens. So they would claim their military service, birthright citizenship, orthodox Protestantism, military service, <coughs> we speak the same language as you. In English. Who is the same deck? Irish and Germans. Most of the Irish, once they come in during the famine, don't speak English. They're from the West. God knows they're not Protestants. They come from strange aristocratic countries. So there is a distinct nativist cast to black republicanism. It should not surprise us or shock us. It is, as you heard me say this at lunch, at least, unlike their white allies, they didn't tell vicious patty stories. They didn't go there. They were dignified about it. They were quite clear that they had more right to claim their Americanness than someone who had just gotten off the boat from Liverpool. And I will say that I, I cannot blame them for that. So um, now we get down to it. Um, there are three different versions of black politics in this book. Where they were never disfranchised, where they had long voted but lost it because of partisan moves, and where they got it back. And that is a way of thinking about my case studies. Um, we'll start then. The first of these case studies is Pennsylvania. Um, now, I'm, I'm a Pennsylvanian, um, basically. And I will note that, and this is really shocking, if you're a US historian, you've been trained to think in terms of you are, you are an inhabitant of a certain period. You're a medial historian. You're an early republic. You do not think in terms of continuities. That's sort of a boring idea. Implies like you believe in national culture or something. I'll tell you, I've come to believe in deep continuities. For instance, that Pennsylvania is a really strange, backwards, antique place where things are deliberately 18th century, like voting, taken from me, liquor laws, 
in a political culture that has no center. Pennsylvania is broken up into micro-regions, and it always has been. And this is striking that this is true today, and it was true at the revolution. <laughs> So the local is invented, it, and that's this is true today. They really decide at the county level who votes. So I, I help organize. I have for almost 20 years students to vote in Lancaster, FNM, Franklin and Marshall. Other counties they don't let students vote. They don't care about the Supreme Court decision saying you can. They just don't let them vote. So um, so Pennsylvania is very localized. Black men for 40 years vote all over the state in key counties. That's the key. The fact I want to leave you with. Okay. Both of Pennsylvania's original constitutions had nothing about race in them. They had non-racial taxpayer sovereignty, the 1790 Constitution. This was, um, there's a word for this, localized sort of county-wide or you know, regional politics in Pennsylvania. Uh, a great historian 50 or 60 years ago, I think it was Franklin Marshall, called it a game without rules, and that's accurate. So um, when I talk about it, I'm just gesturing to what I do in the Pennsylvania section. Um, yes, plenty of places especially more Jeffersonian Republican ones, did keep out black men, and others didn't. Lots of, they kept out lots of other men, too, um, not allowing naturalized citizens to vote, not allowing the sons of naturalized citizens to vote, not allowing men uh, who hadn't lived there for some period of time. Um, there were all kinds of exclusions, not just you know, the racial one county by county that had no, no basis in law. Um, here's the thing about, and this is the historiography, I've realized, going back over this, that there's something I might call the, the, the metropolitan myth, that you can reduce Pennsylvania to Philadelphia, that you can reduce New England to Boston, that you can re reduce the Empire State to New York. It's convenient. There's a big historiography. You can add to it. There's a very well-established historiography that black men were free and very active and built a huge community and many big churches, but never voted in Philadelphia. And that has been taken as a given that's all that matters to the state because the assumption seems to have been by these very distinguished historians that black Philadelphia, the North's largest free black community, was really all that mattered in Pennsylvania, probably where most of the black people were. No, actually. There was no point where the majority of free black people in Pennsylvania were in Philadelphia, and the number went down and down and down. There were large populations, even in rural counties around the state. And in many of those key rural counties, the largest ones, they kept voting for 40 years. And that's what I document. And that's basically what I would want you to know. This leads up to the last, the last disfranchisement before the Civil War, the culmination of racial disfranchisement in Pennsylvania in 1837-38. Um, and I want to finish by talking about that. This is not unknown. It's not nobody's ever written about this. Um, it is, as in every other case, then and today, driven by naked power politics, not by some kind of special racial ideology. It's power politics. The fractured, factionalized Democrats, Jeffersonians, who had dominated Pennsylvania, the so-called keystone in the Republican march for four decades, and in the 1830s, finally are taken down by Whigs and anti-Masons, led by Thaddeus Stevens, the greatest revolutionary in American history, as far as I'm concerned. Quite seriously. Truly. One really, really, you know, American Lenin passed the 14th Amendment. Reconstruction would have survived if he'd lived. So Thaddeus Stevens, you know, the radical Republican, well, he's sitting there putting together an anti-Masonic Whig coalition 1835, they elect Simon Rittner. Stevens right behind him. These men are abolitionists. They talk abolition. They say Pennsylvania will no, no longer bow its knee to slavery. That's Rittner's first address as governor. So the Democrats are on the back foot. What are they going to do? They start passing a registry law for Philadelphia. That means you can't naturalize Irishmen right off the boat. The original registry laws were Whigs saying we're going to try to stop the Democrats from doing that. You know? So this is power politics. And the Democrats come back via a state constitutional convention, a state Supreme Court decision, a whole series of moves in 1837-38. And it is driven by power politics. And it's shockingly modern. I'll just give you the quick outline. Way up in Luzerne County, that's the Connecticut settled Yankee part of Pennsylvania, a black farmer, one of the way up in the upper tier of farmers in that county. I used the census. I can tell you exactly where he fits. He's way up in the upper tier. His family had been there for 40 years. He probably voted for a very long time. 
William Fogg. He goes up to vote in 1836, and some Democratic judge of elections, which is really the most important position there is in election day, just refuses him on the basis of his color. The local judge says, <clears throat> this is ridiculous. There's nothing in the law of Pennsylvania that says color, complexion, has anything to do with voting. I overturn it. Goes to the state Supreme Court. It's sitting in the state Supreme Court. <clears throat> in 1837, there's an election in Bucks County, sixth largest county in the state. And the Whigs sweep it by very narrow margins. And the Democrats go on, go to war and start saying, not only have they taken all the county offices, the state legislators, but the Whigs are planning to import thousands of black men from the South to outvote you, white men. And this isn't obscure. This is blaring headlines back and forth. There is a big black vote in Bucks County. One of the richest men in the county is a man who is quite frankly phenotypically looks not much different from me, Robert Purvis, but never leaves anyone in doubt that he is a man of color. And he's one of the richest men in the county. And he's named quite often, that man there, in Bywater Township. So there's a fight, and that goes to the state Supreme Court. And then there's a constitutional convention, which originally turns down the Philadelphia Irish Democrats trying to stick white into the Constitution is ridiculous. Thaddeus Stevens wants to keep the taxpaying suffrage requirement to keep out paupers. This is a class over race argument. And then there's a season in between the Constitution Convention stops meeting and the Democrats mobilize and these things are happening in bucks and they come back and suddenly all these people, Whigs, and defect. They do not want to get race baited. And suddenly Pennsylvania has white suffrage in 1838. With the Supreme Court decision capping it, it's, it's, voted, it's passed more than once, declaring that it, always, it had always been from its founding a community of white men exclusively, almost exactly the same language that Justice Taney uses in 1857. Taney, not Taney, Taney, Dred Scott, Chief Justice. So this is Taneyism before Taney, and it is the Democratic Party. So that's Pennsylvania. This is an example of where black men had been voting. And you know, you can use County tax rolls, the suffer you can look at it and dig it out and find names in the newspapers. In one case, there was a man who had been voting for about 40 years who listed himself in the census as born in Africa. So this is, there was nothing <clears throat> obscure or strange. This is sort of part of the fabric of life. It wasn't so unusual. So now we move on to New England, or what I call Upper New England, Massachusetts and the states north of it, what I would call the Yankee Republic. Um, that's, I've made that up. It's my turn. Um, to, uh, and I, I relied on uh, Jefferson, my friend and colleague, David Wallstreicher's remarkable book, um, Perpetual Fets. What is it? The title? In the Midst of Perpetual Fets. In the Midst of Perpetual Fets, <clears throat> where David argues this is one of the most important books in early American history. He, he says you need to understand that the early United States is made up of sectional nationalisms. We would never use the word sectional now. Now we would say regional. Then we said sectional. Not one American, but sectional. Sectional nationalism of Upper New England is fundamentally anti-Southern, therefore anti-slave, and sometimes, quite often, therefore anti-racial. That's my argument. So um, now, let's stop and think about New England now, especially Upper New England. Admit what you have in your head is some travel guy who think quaint little old places, witches, fishing villages, people with funny accents. and. New England is small, it's a small place, you know, minus two senators per state, really small, okay? Um, that's not how it was then. In 1810, New England controlled one-fourth of the House of Representatives, 35 of 143 seats, versus 21 now, 5%. So think of that, from one quarter to 5%. Vermont and the Maine district, Maine was then a district of Massachusetts, each sent four, and New Hampshire sent five, so that's a total of 13 out of 143 in the House, um, versus what they have now, which is um, a reduction. They were nine, those three states were 9% of the House then, now they're 1%. So if there is a region of the country that originally all six, all, all of New England was non racial, and then something happens, but Upper New England becomes more and more aggressively non racial, if there is a large and powerful region, as an aggressively non-racial, I'm not arguing for total equality. I'm not remotely talking about social equality. I'm talking about juridical, public equality, the right to vote, the right to be treated re with reasonable respect in the courts, things like that. Okay? 
if there is a large and powerful region, economically powerful, that's, that's a fact that we need to keep in mind. So um, what my case studies focus on port towns. And it is a fact that where black men voted almost without exception were in the places that were the most economically um, advanced um, mercantile and agrarian capitalist sites. But Jim Stewart made that point about abolitionism 40 or 50 years ago, that abolitionism flourished where market capitalism flourished. And I think, not surprisingly, it's where black men voted openly and exerted power. So I look at the port towns. Um, I do start off looking at New England as a whole, and especially Massachusetts. Um, as early as 1788, I think, or 87, um, Jeremy Belknap, who's actually almost the founder of history in America, you know, noted Prince Hall, founder of the Prince Hall Masonry, Black Masons, bringing his men to the polls in 1788. By the early 1790s, there are jokes about John Hancock, who likes to shake hands with black men. Um, by 1800, it's beginning to be alleged, usually by Republicans, that they are a balance of power in statewide elections in Massachusetts. <clears throat> so that's just a gesture. This is not just Boston. It's actually especially Salem. And Salem is, I think, the ninth largest city in the country, and economically extremely dynamic in the late 18th century, early 19th century. And there they are you know, a very significant presence. Um, by the 1820s, there is a distinct political class, especially in Boston well-off men, um, uh, perfumers, hairdressers, caterers. They, they, they are in a symbiotic economic relationship to the Brahmin upper class, but they are in no shape or form subordinate to them. They are very, very aggressive, but I will let you read the book to find out about them. So these are the people who welcome in David Walker from Charleston. He fits into an aggressive political class, very old. This is, and I'm looking at Jeff here, this is what the Bobolition, the Bobolition things are about. It's about these men marching in uniform. It's not made up. All right, um, let me talk about a few of these port towns. And here I need to keep stressing that these towns are not what they are now. Portland, lovely, 60,000 people, the size of Lancaster. It's a great place. Portland then, lumber capital of the world. Almost unbelievable how central it is, shipping everywhere. Black men control the waterfront in Portland. They are in measurable, and I do measure, I count, uh, presence in key Portland wards, electoral presence, you know, significant percentage. <clears throat> and they are in politics very early on. As early as the 1820s, they're getting patronage positions in Portland city government. They are in there with the National Republicans and then Whigs. I think I want to try to boil this down, so I'll just give you the anecdote that gets at this. Founding the Whig Party in Maine in 1834, two of the four Portland delegates are black men. And what's interesting is, because this goes up against all of the received histories of abolitionism, these men and their leading white allies in those parties are, are all get hardcore abolitionists. They're in party politics, mainstream party politics, national, Republican, and Whig, and very serious, open leaders of abolition. So that's Portland. Um, <clears throat> and there's never the slightest challenge to their voting at all. And they stay in that. Patronage positions and party positions as Whigs then as Republicans, <clears throat> and it's a nice, kind of neat story. Um, then I move on. Um, I do actually, at this for this, move over Boston because Steve Kantrowitz has done Boston, actually, at least from 1829. Then we look at New Bedford. Okay, if you even thought about New Bedford, you would basically say, oh, yet another northeastern mill town, probably depressed, a uh, bunch of Irish, maybe Portuguese, Cape Verdeans, actually, but run down. Like, what are they going to do with those mill buildings? Try to hawk them to tourists. OK, <laughs> Bedford, the period we're talking about. And these are cities, by the definition then, even if they've got 15,000 people, that's a city, OK? New Bedford is the wealthiest place in America. Fabulously wealthy. Per capita income of about $2,500. It's extraordinary per capita income. This is significantly shared with its very, very large black population who are on the ships, in the stores, playing a central role tightly tied up with New Bedford's extremely distinct Quaker Whig upper class. And this is not some obscure fact. People know about this. This is a well-known go, go to New Bedford and see that. See those black men walking the streets. <clears throat> and from the 18, that's why it's referred to sometimes as a Gibraltar or a Sebastopol. These are images of a fortress of black political power. <clears throat> and um, from at least the 1830s, and I have <clears throat> evidence is very strong, the black man, black electorate, operates as an autonomous power block, moving between all of the parties, giving its vote. In New Bedford, and this is extremely unusual, 
they do actually influence and participate with the Democrats. That's quite something. I don't mean a few odd Democrats, but leading Democrats. And they will split their vote, and they will issue endorsements, cards to take to the polls, saying who the black men favored. Yes, I found that in the press being reproduced. So I will boil New Bedford down by telling a story. Now, this is in Douglas's My Bondage and My Freedom, so it shouldn't be obscure, right? I mean, that's not an obscure book. And yet, I don't mean to make fun of I'm so proud of myself, but it's like sitting right in front of you. Um, Douglas comes from Baltimore to Philadelphia because he's wearing a, a sailor's togs, and that means he's a free man, and people are like, yeah, sure, he's not, he's not a slave. <clears throat> in Philadelphia, they send him to David Ruggles Bookshop, a block from my house, a church in Lispinard, Lower Manhattan. It's a beautiful building. There's a plaque up there. It's a great coffee shop now, but it's an historic site. David Ruggles is so notorious a black abolitionist and underground railroad guy that in 1840, Democrats try to tar him, William Henry Harrison, with being allied David Burroughs, because that's what the Whigs are like. I kid you not, he's not obscure at all, because he really takes it to the slaveholders. They come to New York, and he takes their slaves away from them. So he's sent to David Ruggles' bookshop, and Ruggles says, I'm going to send you up to Nathan Johnson in New Bedford. Nathan Johnson is a wealthy black confectioner. Everything delicious and sweet he brings to white people, candy, cakes, custards, ice cream, special fruits, all of these are delicacies, he and his wife. They're very well off. He's actually a Democrat, oddly enough, but he's a hardcore abolitionist. So the party politics aren't necessarily the same. <clears throat> the kind of man who, if someone is perceived to be a renegade informing on fugitives, he will lead them off to drive them out. So um, Douglas goes to meet him, and Douglas is 20 years old, Frederick Bailey, and Johnson welcomes him and says, listen, you're here. Anything is possible in the Bay State, in the Bay State, as I quote, there was nothing in the Constitution of Massachusetts to prevent a colored man from holding any office in the state. <laughs> there it is in my bondage and my freedom, and yet, I don't know, to, if that's what Massachusetts represents, that's what New Bedford represents, is that kind of degree. Um, I have a chapter on Providence as a whole different story. I call it premature reconstruction. I will boil it down as it's um, Black men were disfranchised with very little Notice, it just sort of happened in 1822. I think it was linked to disfranchisement in Connecticut in 1818 and New York in 1821, since those states are next in a back thing there. It seems to have been something in what we call the Lower North. <clears throat> 1822, they're disfranchised. And Providence is a bigger black population because there was a lot of slavery in Rhode Island. 1842, they're re-enfranchised like that. Why? To keep out the Irish. There's been an armed insurgency in Rhode Island, the Door War. And at a crucial point, the leaders of this insurgency to bring in universal white suffrage, armed, really, an armed insurgency. There were battles. Not much of a battles, but there were, with guns and cannons. At a crucial point, the leaders of that insurgency, the People's Party, they had a choice. Black men confronted them and said, we'll come in with you. And said, eh, maybe later for you, but support us anyway. But no, we're not going to do that. It's too controversial. So the extremely conservative what will become Whigs in Rhode Island, first enlist black men in the militia. They patrol the streets of Providence. Um, you know, they play a role in suppressing the insurrection and then enfranchise them to keep out the Irish. Uh, and that they remain a balance of power. Cottrell did this, but I go a lot further. For decades to come, a block vote in Providence. And it is sort of look like the more venal or opportunistic version of Reconstruction. But they're voting, you know, <laughs> they're enfranchised. Um, and then we get up to, and you will give me a high sign if I should be wrapping it up, right? Yeah. Well, I'm so interested, so I don't know what. <laughs> Let me just talk a bit about New York, which is sort of the That's center of this book because <clears throat> I call it that section quite long, the New York Battleground. But here's why, okay? New York, in the period I'm talking about, let's say 1840, is bigger in national politics, significantly bigger than California is today. That's how big New York is. In 1840, it is one seventh of the Electoral College. And here, I did this, I did counted the numbers. Um, more than one in six free Americans lived in New York in 1840. Um, minus counting enslaved people as for three, three fifths for purposes of representation, minus that, <clears throat> the Deep South, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas had over, just over half as many voters as New York in 1840. Think about that weight. That makes it a battleground. Only by adding, you know, 
about 762,000 slaves counted for purposes of representation. It's, you know, the three-fifths. Could they, those, all of those states, the Cotton South, equal New York in the Electoral College, equal New York. So it's a hell of a prize. So um, now, and it's clearly by even well before 1840, New York has become the finance center, the technology center, the center of so much <clears throat> because of the Erie Canal, the only really great state-sponsored industrial development project in this country until I guess maybe the TBA, and it's DeWitt Clinton. And not incidentally, that's one of the men who ends up supporting black suffrage, maintaining relationships with black men. So because of the Erie Canal, linking the lakes with the city, down the Hudson, you know, it's a circuit has been created. So New York is, you know, it, it really is the Empire State. Now, the other point that needs to be made, this is Craig um, Wilder's stuff. Greater New York City, up the Hudson, out the island, maybe even northwest, eastern New Jersey, is functionally pretty close to being a slave society. The Dutch farmers who dominate Virtually all of them either own or employ enslaved labor, which is the definition of a slave society. But that's a principal form, a the principal form. And one can argue over it, but it's close enough to really think about what that means. And then we move on to the revolution, where that whole area becomes the heartland of fierce loyalism among poor whites and formerly enslaved black people. And we should be clear about that. You walk up the Hudson, you're not going to find a lot of patriots up the Hudson. You're going to find a lot of tenants on the Dutch manor estates who like the British. And a lot of free black people have come in in the thousands. And that's a whole story, and I'm not the one who told it, but it's, it's quite a story. Um, so and that meant that post-revolution, and uh, that's Shane White, black New Yorkers down in the city and around, because of their experience of being free under the British and being mobilized as guerrilla soldiers, as regular soldiers, just serve the British in all kinds of ways, <clears throat> they had a very aggressive militant political consciousness, even though slavery persisted in New York State until 1828. There were still 4,000 enslaved people in 1828. And Sojourner Truth was born a Dutch-speaking enslaved person who was sold three times and spent her entire early life as an enslaved person being sold, her children being sold away from her. That's New York State. So it's a hell of a picture, right? Slavery really still exists, and yet there's a militant free black community at the same time. Totally. Very strange. So wrapping this up, um, I say that. I shouldn't say that. I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> now, the thing about New York, and I, I find myself, um, I want to actually I mean, talk about the larger history, because that's what matters here. New York in this period is being shaped first by one and then another huge migration. At the time of the revolution, New York was nowhere near the top of the original 13. It was sixth in population. It was not. Virginia was the big one, OK? Um, and then, and there were, in 1790, west of Albany, 30,000 white people west of Albany. It's not a lot. Do you know how large that territory is? 30 years later, there were 3 quarters of a million. And where did they come from? They came from New England. They brought with them the distinctive cultural features, which I take very seriously, of New England. They were aggressively literate, aggressively religious, and very serious about their religion, and bringing with them that anti-Southern, anti-slavery consciousness. And that's how we get the burnt over district, a very famous trope of that part of upstate New York, becomes the heartland of abol radical abolitionism. The Liberty Party, that's why Douglas went to Rochester. This is, this is the heartland, the biggest part, other than you know, Yankee Dome itself. So that's Yankee, Yankee Upper New York. And then the other one, my poor Paris, I guess they went to Boston, not New York, the Irish. <laughs> the Irish coming in. The famine Irish, desperately poor, um, subject to whatever the Democratic Party will give them. And sad to say, violently racialist for reasons that are still worth considering. But say, I, I do think Noel Ignatieff's book, When the Irish Became White, is it's a pretty good book. It's pretty serious that they had not been what we would think of as white, meaning first class, upper caste in Ireland. They were racialized and they came to America and got a chance to be and they grabbed onto it. <coughs> uh, to use the word at the time, this is a good word, degrophobic. So it's ugly. So New York full of Irish, plus the Germans who don't seem to be much better. Um, yeah, this is the road to the draft rights in 1863, which is the worst violence in actual American history. New York, think of this now. New York City is the heartland of pro-Southern, pro-slavery, white nationalism, and the rural white counties upstate, with some black people in them, 
are the heartland of anti-slavery and non-racialism. How things have changed. So that's New York. Um, <clears throat> I've already talked about the very long emancipation. I will, between about 1800 and 1815, New York City and other parts of the state as well, not just New York, but especially New York City, what we would call Manhattan today, New York County, <clears throat> is the, has the most dynamic black politics of anywhere in the country. They're voting all over New England, and they're being noticed and competed for and sought their votes. But in New York, they become a large, mobilized, militant electorate in the midst of extremely contentious factional battles. And this is a really dense, tricky history um, that I'm not going to try to sum up here. I will simply sketch it briefly so you get a sense. So I want to talk about a man named Stephen Van Rensselaer, the last patroon. You're looking at me like, what does that mean? Um, it is generally accepted that there was one place in America where feudalism existed was on the Dutch estates, the manors, up the Hudson River, places of 200, 400,000 acres, with hereditary tenants on them over generations, white people. And there were the various manor lords, what are still big names in New York. There are some of them exiled as Tories, the Phillipses, the Livingstons, the Cortlands. The greatest of them were the Van Rensselaers. Um, now, Stephen Van Rensselaer, this, this would give you an idea why this is very strange politics. Stephen Van Rensselaer has been credibly alleged to have been the richest American in American history. That's how rich he was. He had what is now Rensselaer County, a state bigger than we can imagine, tens of thousands of tenants. And he was, for decades, profoundly anti-racial. He ran for governor several times as a Federalist. Yes, this is colleague of Jay and Madison. We all know about that now, and Hamilton, because of Hamilton the musical. So this is, these, he is an example of an Anglican, Federalist, many of them loyalist, not him, uh, and pro-black. And as early as 1801, it was alleged that his partisans, prominent ju a judge in Manhattan, is trying to wheedle black men, offering them crackers and extravagant promises to vote for Stephen Van Rensselaer for governor. In 1804, the same thing is when Aaron Burr tries to come in. Aaron Burr is shocking. Impressive, really seedy political operator. He comes and he splits. He's already, he's not going to be vice president again. He's in the doghouse with the regular Republicans. So he runs as a dissenting Republican and is charged that he's had 24 colored gentlemen to his mansion to buy them off or get them to mobilize their vote. These are simply two examples. When the Federalist Party comes back, as they do from 1807 to 1815, the notion that the Federalists just always decline is not true. The Federalists come back because of Jefferson's embargo things like that, and a really unpopular war. In New York, the Federalists are repeatedly alleged to be swinging countywide legislative elections for the state assembly with a massive black vote, which is to say black men are mobilizing. And the evidence is that that is exactly what they did. That they did, in fact, swing elections with 800 or 1,000 votes concentrated in key wards in New York City. And this is what leads to the disenfranchisement um, formally imposition of a very restricted freehold property requirement on black men in 1821. Um, so that summarized up several chapters or a very large part of the book. The point I want to make about that disfranchisement, the imposition of a property requirement that had formally applied to everyone in New York, both the governor and state senate, is now taken off all the white men and put on the black men for all voting. And my belief and I, I can argue it circumstantially, but I think strongly, is that this is really the doing of Martin Van Buren. And I think Martin Van Buren is actually, I mean, it's not that people don't know who he is, but he's not just a, an interesting figure. He actually is the architect of the Democratic Party in the full sense. And this is an, an early example. And he had been practicing racial disfranchisement up in Columbia County long before this, when he was a local figure only. This is a through line there of what I would call, for this Dutchman, an accent, in both democracy. So I'm not alluding to South Africa. I'm saying, yes, actually, these Dutch seem to have really practiced it wherever they were. So that's New York. The second, and then I'll try to wrap up. They're disfranchised. The example that is Dutchess County, or large, East River counties, large black populations, plenty of votes to be had. In 1825, in the decennial census, there were 8,957 white voters and 28 black voters in Dutchess County. Um, and there were only 298 registered black voters in the whole state. And you go through, see one here, one here, two there. That's what this very artful thing that Martin Van Buren did. 
wasn't explicit. It was racial. It said men of color, but it wasn't total. It was property based. The latter part of the story is of a battle that begins about 1837 and goes up to 1860. Virtually unceasing, unremitting battle by the largest political class of free black men in the North. A huge, very large cadre. Um, Douglas comes in and joins them. Henry Highland Garnett, Samuel Regal Ward, James McKean Smith, and many more. Men of national repute. Men known by white people, named in white newspapers with praise with disgust. Um, a battle to get the suffrage back. Now, what I, what I argue, and I believe the evidence is sufficiently convincing, is that when they claim, between 1855 and 1860, that when black men claim 11,000 votes in New York, that they're probably not exaggerating much. And what we know is, is that there's enough votes for Thurlow Weed, the most impressive party operator in 19th century politics. I would argue Thurlow Weed is the, um, the mastermind behind the William, William Seward's machine in Whig and Republican politics. Remember, this is how big this thing is. So uh, nowadays, people have heard of Tammany Hall politicians, maybe something like that. Thurlow Weed is above all of them. He's a byword for an effective machine. He built the anti-Masonic and then Whig machine in the 1830s and 40s. And then he transfers all of that into the New York State Republican Party. So he is a su supreme kingmaker, a huge all throughout the state in the service of William Seward, who is, who is a heroic figure in the white man who you know, Seward really deserves the praise, the, the good feeling of black men back then. Because he never backed down from 1839. He upheld their rights and their equal citizenship and advocated the suffrage. So Thurlow Weed's behind him. And he supports it too. And in 1855, 1860, the evidence is clear that he funded, employed organizers, a black submachine around the state to get out their vote and to keep them from going over to the radical abolitionist party. So this is a very big story, but it does culminate in a significant number of votes. All right, this is a lot to throw at you. I'm going to, I'm going to speak for about a minute about Ohio. <laughs> Ohio's a weird, this is really, this is so strange, I've got to make sure you understand this. So Ohio, and it's, and it's, you know, this is the Northwest, you know what that means. Never was a slave society, right? Now we're talking about something different. The original 13 had all been either slave societies or societies with slaves. There was no place without them among the original 13. The Northwest Ordinance says this will be a slaveless society, right? <clears throat> 1802 Ohio Constitutional Convention. They actually debate, and the vote is very narrow, about whether to disfranchise black men in their new state constitution. Some black men had voted as a territory. We know that, because people referred to it at the time. Some, because there was no racial qualifier in the territorial legislation. So it's, it's a close vote. It goes back and forth. But the Virginians, who'd come up to a slaveless place, did not want, the, so to speak, their former freedmen voting against them. So Ohio puts in that other thing, which you might call denizenship, a caste status, not a citizen. Black laws, all of it's there, even if they're not enforced. Black laws are, you know, you, you must pay this bond, you must have a certificate, someone must certify you, you may not move from county to county, all of this stuff that sounds like the South or the Jim Crow South or whatever. A lot of these are not observed, but they're very real. And Ohio is filling up with free people who've gotten out of Virginia, basically. They're freed by their Quaker owners, or run away or bought their freedom. And they're living in Ohio in a caste-like status. They have no political standing at all. And then something strange happens. And I'm like, you're not, you're not, if you don't know this story, it's going to really shock you. I mean this. <clears throat> Starting in 1823 and then at least four more times through 1860, 1823, 1860, the Ohio Supreme Court affirms, unequivocally affirms, that to be white means to be preponderantly white. To be to claim yourself or to be believed as majority white. Meaning mulattoes, mixed race men can vote. What that really means is the person who controls the poll accepts your word that you are not entirely, that you're preponderantly white, regardless of what you look like. That's what that means. And we know that. By the 1850s, it's you know, Republicans let any man of color vote. So yeah as dark as he is. And the leading black politician boasts about this in St. Louis in 1865. 
to the lawn and the lake shore. We don't care how black he is. That's John Mercer Langston. So a whole political constituency emerges of men asserting that they are mixed race, preponderantly white, from at least 1840 on, and I trace this in detail. You know, court cases, challenges to elections, lots of newspaper, who's letting them vote? Whigs, presumably. <clears throat> By the 1850s, they're becoming a really significant constituency. Now, by the 1850s, Ohio is the third largest state in the country. So I will conclude this. If in 1860, all of New England except Connecticut, New York, and Ohio have some significant, if not total, black suffrage, that's, that's enough for me to say this matters. And that's, I'm going to conclude there by quoting the cover of my book. <laughs> no, 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 see what, the, what I'm implying about this. Let's get rid of this paper. So this is, um, this is an article from the New York Herald on Election Day 1860, which every one of us knows is the most important election in American history, because it's the thing that tears us apart, right? That's it. The New York Herald is, and I've referred to it, I think, already. The New York Herald is like Fox News times three. It is such a powerful paper. James Gordon Bennett, the editor. An oddly close personal relationship with some leading black men in New York, which tells you how complex this is. So here's this article, you know. Lincoln is sure to be defeated. This is whistling through the graveyard. The Supreme Court has decided in the Dred Scott case that Negroes are not citizens of the United States. The Senate and House of Representatives in Congress are both anti-Lincoln, he thinks, he hopes. <clears throat> and if they open the electoral returns and count the votes, they will, of course, throw out the 14,000 Negro votes in Ohio, well, uh, which gives that state to the Democrats. And with Nevada and California um, and the whole South, defeats Lincoln. So the central Democratic paper read I mean, the circulation is hard to imagine today, the equivalent of several tens of millions, read all over the country is saying that 14,000 Negro votes. I don't think there were 14,000 black votes in Ohio. There might have been eight. I can, we can count with the census. But that's what they're claiming will defeat Lincoln. That is actually the argument of my book. That it matters because Democrats, partisans, would make these claims so as to whip up their electorate. But also, imagine being a black man in New York or anywhere else and reading that in 1860. I would encourage you to go out and vote for Abe Lincoln, whatever you thought of him. So that's the argument of the book. Well, I got a question. We have time for questions, and we're going to try to get the, some of our technology going here. So, uh, and take a question. Sure. Yes. Um, so I have a quick comment and a question. Uh, my comment, uh, your talk reminded me of me reading the book for a class this week, and that I got really caught up in those first few chapters, and I got to Ohio, and I was like, I, I'm going to have to speak through this a little bit. Um, so I look forward to going back to There's so much of it. Um, my question um, is about the title of the book, for yeah. Reconstruction. Yeah. Um, there was a little bit of a debate in class about whether it was a reconstruction or if it was more of a deconstruction at the period. Um, so could you touch on that and touch on how you came up with the title and how you view that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Originally, it was just the title of the introduction that Jim Stewart I had told me I had to write one, so I did. And I thought, OK, I'm going to call this. And somewhere in there, I think right after I wrote it, Steve Hahn published a, a short book, his lectures at Harvard, the series, where he had made this argument. I quote it very, I'm just saying, like, I sort of like, huh, you know. So it's a theoretical concept, frankly. Emancipations lead to reconstructions because by their nature, they everything is reorganized. You, it could be a, a reactionary reconstruction or a radical one, but there will be one because if the emancipation is meaningful, you change the order. So re that's the title of the book that I did with Walt Treasure, Revolutions and Reconstructions. So I'm saying that there was a slow, more gradual first reconstruction across the world. And I think that's, it's a way of, it's a heuristic tool, I guess you could say, of getting us to stop breaking American history into civil wars if everything starts over and think about long continuities, a continuity of reconstruction. So this is a really good question. I've, and I've been asked it before. And I think it's, I mean, it's definitely a concept. It's another way of saying it is that, I mean, there's no question what I think of as, you know, the most important book in American history in my lifetime, which is Eric Foner's Reconstruction. Because I think that he forced us to think about what is the pivot of American history. What's the subtitle? America's Unfinished Revolution. And as I guess I made clear at the end, if you get the end of my book, I think it is still an unfinished revolution. 
So there's an implied politics behind the first reconstruction, uh, second reconstruction, and third, you know, that we're always, in a sense, continuing. I hope that, that answers your question. Yeah, there's a concept with some political implications. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Max. Uh, hi, I'm Max. Um, I was wondering uh, why would the middle lower class, uh, the white middle lower class in America, be more opposed to uh, African Americans voting than, say, like the Irish or German immigrants? <laughs> Well, the thing is, I don't think there is such a, I think that, that I mean, it's not, only, it's not just me. When I was, you know, grounding myself in abolitionist history and who were they, I remember reading these. I can't remember, but you'll probably remember. You know, you can go through and you can actually find out which, which branch of which religious denomination is likely to be anti-slavery and which is not. And across very large parts of the North, they're, they're deeply divided. And, and the division actually is seriously exacerbated by the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. That's where you kind of got to choose. Either my neighbor's still got habeas corpus or he doesn't because of his skin color. That really will force you to choose. <clears throat> so I think it's a division originally in the South too, but that's another story, quite a bit in the South, but especially in this thing that we come to call the North between lower and, lower and middle class white people. Um, Historians of abolition argue for distinct constituencies among artisans and working men that are anti-slavery. Again, based on, I think, sort of where they're located, their religious or ethnic affiliations. And, um, but then there's a way in which party itself is an independent variable. I, and I cited this at our luncheon. I think that um, Patty Riley in particular, I mean, people, you go into a party, how can I not think that this is relevant today? And I mean, for both Democrats and Republicans. You go into the party, and that party pulls you towards the dominant or necessary affiliations of the party, right? And otherwise, you're politically neutered, and you leave and become a nothing. And that's especially if party, we all know, everyone knows party affiliation is almost entirely inherited, realistically. So it's a really big deal. So people find themselves becoming, you know, I, I will try to do this with an example that won't, you know, that will be neutral. People who would have never given Bernie Sanders the time of day will say, oh, he's a good Democrat, you know, because that's what their partisanship has led them. So that, I hope that's answering your thing. But I, I think that, um, and actually, the people, the white allies, to use our current terminology, of the black men, part of what also, it is quite often, you know, <laughs> friend of my friend, enemy, enemy, friend of my enemy might be the Irishman who's voting over there. Well, because you're like that, I'm over here. I'm making this choice. And you can see that. I talk about that, of that um, uh, sort of ethno-racial divide. I hope that. In front, but, and then I'm going to also, while, while we take this question, I'm going to invite anyone who's on Zoom to try to ask a question, because we went to a lot of trouble to get the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> We'd actually like to see whether it does. So I'll, I say that to the air. Go, go ahead. I think this is a fairly brief uh, question. Sure. You mentioned how the upper New Englanders were sort of rabidly anti-Southern. I wonder if you could just talk about the origin and the source of that. Is it philosophical oh, sure. or Absolutely. economic or um, cultural? Well, it's, it's, it, it's one thing and then another, actually. Originally, um, I mean, these, at least among some of them, it is, it is their particular Protestant. You know, I mean, there is some of that. You know, the selling of Joseph by Samuel Seal going way back. There are some, but I also point out that people who weren't at all religious also felt this way. It's just, it seems, it seems to have been they're offended by it. Partially because, after all, that old New England culture has a, a, is anti aristocratic. So they use words like nabobs a lot, which is, of course, imported from British India, but means, you know, a, a corrupt princeling. Those nabobs with their serfs, meaning Jefferson with his slaves, right? Actually, quite literally meaning Jefferson, because they don't like Jefferson. The, the, the other side called the Federals nabobs too. Well, okay. Everybody <laughs> hated nabobs and <laughs> St. But there's <laughs> also, the but, but then more, more, <laughs> more specifically, there is a very serious political economic element. The Hartford Convention is a real thing. A lot of New England does want to secede when Mr. Jefferson's war, you know, Mr. Madison's war, sorry, but it's Jefferson's originally, leads them into this utterly ruinous you know, blockade. They are blue lights. They are trading with the enemy. They, why are we? Why are we in a, in a in a country with these people? They want tariffs. The Southerners do not. That's a through line. Never want tariffs. 
So things, various currents run together. And there is, I mean, the fact that, you know, the, the likelihood in any of these port towns is that the free black man is in some way involved in the maritime, you know, they are. They're saltwater voters, and the Federalists who want their votes are saltwater merchants. So they have that reason. Um, I think it's that combination. And then, oh, the other part is, I mean, it needs to be, we need to be reminded that for what was, would have then been a complete generation, 1820, 1800, 1824, the country is governed by Virginia. New England does not want to be governed by Virginia. Now, that actually does not sit well. The defeat of John Adams, uh, the, the eclipse of New England political power. So I would say it's those things combined, and it feeds into opposition to the South and slavery, and then a certain kind of non-racial thinking. Anybody on, anybody on Zoom? Reed, you got a question? Undo, un unmute yourself. Yes. Right. I'm <laughs> unmuting myself. Um, and uh, Van, we haven't met, but I'm, I'm, I'm up to New York just after 1821, and uh, your book is blowing my mind. Um, my question is... Wait, I, know, I, mean, I know who you are. Yeah, you know who you are. Good stuff. Yeah, but we haven't met. We haven't met. Really good stuff. Yeah. Now we have, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> My, one thing that really strikes me as I'm reading your book is you, you, this is, you're, you're telling a national story. Black activists everywhere seem to be converging, and this is true in my own research too, that black activists are converging into a national agenda. Yes. Um, during the 1830s, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. But the story you tell of actual black political power, it looks more like sort of early modern, some early modern empire where every arrangement is local, yeah. um, where political power is, you know, is always distributed among these, these, you know, sort of local rules and yeah. exceptions and things like that. And I'm just wondering, you know, and at the same time, you've got, you've got, you know, both. Uh, uh, the Whigs and the Democrats trying to trying to sort of, you know, corral all these cats uh, that yeah. are their their constituents yeah. and their politicians into these national coalitions as well. Um, at the same time that, um, you know, at least some of your places, the Democrats are still racial egalitarians. It's, yeah. it's just yeah. You just tell the weirdest story, and they, I'm just they don't have the message. What, they didn't get it. <laughs> what is what are the implications of this unevenness of black political power, but of, of clearly a black elite agenda of creating a nationally coherent political community? And you know, what are the uh, and the implications for the parties as well? Well, this may be a, a my, my most strongest answer to this is in my article in the Journal of the Early Republic, <clears throat> and I think it's March 2020, Patchwork Nation. And that is actually my argument, which is, and it's, it's based on Roger Smith's and Desmond King's remarkable book about racial orders and antebellum, an article, sorry, about racial orders. I mean, that's, that's, you know, as I've often said, it's the political scientists who've been clearest about getting at how politics seems to work, at least in terms of the issues that I care about. So I took Roger's and Desmond's article about racial orders in antebellum America or in American history and politics. <coughs> And I extrapolated and said, well, actually, there's a, a shifting series of racial political orders. And I traced that from 1790 to 1860, reaching its, its sort of culmination in, in 1840, where I would delineate. And I'm, it's, it's, I'm looking at the political scientists back there, whatever. Um, I actually tried to publish an APSR and got really good reviews. And finally, Jennifer Hochschild said, it's not that we think this is bad. It's just not enough political science. <laughs> So I got into the Journal of the Early Republic. In 1840, let's say, I think there are six distinct racial political orders in the United States. And it's in the article, and, and I use maps, actually. Like, you know, you can see it where they are. And it is a, a double series of maps of where slavery exists, either slave societies, non-slave societies, or slave societies with slaves, the great typology, Moses Finley. Um, I use that, but then up against that, citizenship, meaning which I'm, and I, there are people who get very don't like this or disagree, <clears throat> but I do think that suffrage is the central aspect of citizenship. That minus that, 
And I know that Martha Jones and I would have a debate about this, okay, for private citizenship. I understand that it means something if you can go to court or petition or get a pass or a contra contract honored. But that is something other than that, at least the claim on political power. So, so the other series of maps traces from 1790 where that form of suffrage citizenship exists. And I guess that's my best answer is that I think they're really distinct. They're not necessarily, in most cases, it's, you know, a passel of states. I think there's, a, as of, you know, circa 1820, there's a lower north of Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, where they, each one of them is disfranchised with black electorates, right? They're separating out from upper New England. So that's by, by way of example. For what it's worth, Louisiana is always as distinct racial political order, including probably maybe through the present, I don't know, but definitely back then. You know, Louisiana is the one place where uh, black, well-off black and white people will go to the same church, and the white people will recognize their black relatives. That's actually what struck me about looking at Louisiana. Like, yes, you know, cousin so-and-so. Think about that. And, you know, of course, those relatives may own significant, own significant number of human beings themselves. So that's my, you know, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure I've completely grasp what what all this means. This, as you said, kind of early modern. It's sort of, it, I, there's ways in which it's a bit, it's a bit mysterious to me, um, because there's so much vaunting patriotism. You know, it's like well, like now. Number one, number one. <laughs> in countries where people really know themselves to be the one thing. They don't talk about it so much. They don't put flags on everything. I don't, I'm sorry. If that's a Puritan Jeremiah, you know, in places like France, the flag is for official things. You don't put it on your bikini or your jean jacket or whatever. You know, it's, it's, they all know themselves to be French. Here, we have to claim it all the time. That seems to be, I'm not going giving you a political rant. I'm saying 200 years ago in the present, we have to constantly claim it because, in fact, it's pretty shifty. Oh, wait a minute. One more thing, though. You know, really, this is quite serious. After all, this is an imperial republic in the literal sense. American imperialism until, you know, roughly 1898 was a process of continental conquest and absorption. It's a distinct form of empire building, which is more in common with Russia than anywhere else, which is um, Arnie Westad's point in global Cold War. So we have to think about that. That's part of why it looks so oddly imperial, is that, you know, look at Missouri. Right? I mean, you're coming in as a, a special example of that, right? Uh, it's about time for one more. Go ahead. This is political science. This political science will is now going to retort. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he was doing being nice. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm thinking out loud a bit here, and it's, a bit, it's going to take a bit to develop this. But So under the Constitution, only one popular elected branch, the House of Representatives, suffrage requirements are tied to the first branch of the state legislature, right? Yeah. That's the, um, the genius of this whole thing. That makes the, the requirements in the state to, at the time of 1787 apply to suffrage immediately after the ratification of the Constitution, right? Okay. So this is a story of federalism to me. Yes. It, I mean, essentially. But is it, does it, see, political scientists take this kind of thing, and some of them want to draw back and say, Oh, well, then that makes the Constitution itself a more celebratory, it provides a more celebratory narrative for the Constitutional Convention and the framers and people like that, because that allowed for this to take place. This uh, history that you're told didn't happen. Uh, actually, the, f the framers did not preclude yeah. uh, this, and it, and it provides a kind of, again, a more celebratory narrative. Huh. That's yeah. It, well, I mean, you know, there's, there's so many opportunities to either damn or celebrate. I mean, once you get up to the 1840s and 50s, it's, you know, the, the biracial abolitionist anti-slavery community is sitting around saying, well, you know, I, I think we can take this part to be the Constitution is the basis, and someone's saying, no, it's a pact with the devil, burn it, right? I, I, I admit, I don't think there's any that the derogation of all of political power of election to the states, which remains of course today effectively, which is something I didn't used to be aware of until recently, uh, creates both extraordinary barriers and great openings. It's both. I, I, that's how it seems to me. It's very. It's it's porous. It's a porous document, right? That's what I love about this narrative is how it complicates American history so, so in so many different and interesting ways. And I thank you for presenting that. 
Um, I just can't find any intention whatsoever with regard to the question, why are we going to assign this suffrage requirements to the states? The only thing that, the only commentary there is in the framing about that is uh, there are two, the laws of the states are too varied to create a uniform uh, national citizenship. Yeah, and that's I, 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 you know what, I admit, I never even thought about that, actually. What? Well, they're punting. Yeah, I think that's what, I mean, you know, I, I put a lot on, even though I know Baron Bacher takes this down in the Dred Scott book, you know, there is the attempt by South Carolina to put white into the articles in 1778, to stick white in, all white inhabitants, and it's defeated overwhelmingly. Um, you know, that, that was certainly a great, there was an attempt to racialize citizenship, and it went down you know, 10 to 2 in, in the uh, Congress in 1778. But it's hard to really be sure what all, I mean, does this add up to intention? That was the word you used. I think it's this punt here, do that there. You know, it's a lot of wheeling and dealing. But I'm not, I'm actually not at all a constitutional scholar. I rely on others for that period of point, to be honest. So, Alan, it's for you to, so it's for you to come up with that one. <laughs> uh, so, so Jay, Jay, when you do the traditional, you know, bring us, bring us, bring us to the, uh, bring us to the pursuit of happiness hour. Well, I'm not going to stand in the way of people getting their free beer. But <laughs> we have time for one more quick question. One more quick question. In the spirit of, of Reeves' question, um, I really like how um, you're kind of taking on, uh, I suppose, nationalism in some ways. You're taking on both the idea of nationalism and its limitations, but the kind of historiographic nationalism that's been so distorting, as you laid it out in the beginning. and. You're breaking down the nation into its its different regional, sectional, constituent parts. Uh, so you're zooming in. I, I wondered if you zoomed out mm -hmm. and took a broader frame, which, of course, uh, I was embarrassing our speaker earlier saying that his uh, AHR article from about 10 years ago spawned the uh, cottage industry of undergraduate dissertations mm -hmm. on, on how uh, African Americans, I mean, the article argued that uh, antebellum African Americans and their black or their political activities really entangled in transatlantic currents of anti-slavery politics. Um, but it strikes me that that broader dimension doesn't really feature in the story on the ground, or or does it? I guess that's my question. Um, are these separate things? The on the ground story of political action and behavior is it connected at all to the stuff that you've written about earlier about? Uh, anti-slavery politics is a transatlantic phenomenon. Well, I, there are places where it comes up, but I, I think I've sort of compartmentalized it. You know, it, it, there, the, the thing is, more than a national stage, I mean, there are ways, because of the constitutional provisions, you know, and because of where the capital is, black men simply do not have access to national politics. They have to be careful going to Washington, D.C. They're really central newspaper, more prior to Douglas, the colored American, Fantastic, remarkable, interesting. If you want to understand black politics, you read The Colored American, coming out of New York, 1837, 1841. It's actually creating a national constituency. That I will say, and I do say that. It puts, it's, they go on the road, they knit everything together in that paper in New York. Okay, so having said that, um, and they have a DC correspondent under you know, an anonymous name. But I mean, you know, DC is a southern city. It's a fright, it's not a, they, they can't lobby there. They can't go there and have meetings the way they would in Albany or Boston or any of the northern state capitals. They, they're, they're kind of kept out, is what I would say, okay? However, where they have almost, you made me think of this, a sure purchase is in this transatlantic, I mean, America is surrounded by the British Empire. America is not a great power. It is not, it's not in a position, it may be a rising economic power, it is not in diplomatic or military terms at all a great power. It may be getting closer by 1860, but it is not. It cannot contest with the British, except under certain favorable circumstances in Costa Rica or someplace like that. The British are a true world superpower, and they demonstrate it every time they hang some slave trader by the neck to show what the Royal Navy could do. And the Americans free them. Every president between 1800 and 1860 had freed people convicted for slave trading. So that's, I'm using as an example. So British power is everywhere. It's even in places like Hawaii, all over the Caribbean, Bermuda, Bahamas, Canada, and Britain, right? That is, so what you're reminding me is, if you go and look at that article, black men 
play on an on a international stage, on the stage of the British Empire. They move around it. Douglas goes from Rochester to Canada to England after to Harper's Ferry. It's a circuit where they raise money. And in that article, I say, make this all, make it again. The closest comparison is the relationship of the Soviet Union, in particular African liberation movements, from you know, 1945 on. This is where you go to, to get material support and diplomatic support and recognition. And that is, I mean, it's really hard to imagine black politics in this period without the British, British money. And also British, I mean, oh, and this is what you and I were talking about. So I want to, it's extraordinarily difficult for Americans to understand that we really were a post-colonial society, deeply in awe of looking up to the much more, more developed, more cultured, more civilized, more literate, you know, metropole, which is England. We're not the metropole, we're the hinterlands. We're the periphery, to use that language. <clears throat> so when the metropole gives a level of recognition, which still shocks, if you read Samuel R. Ward's autobiography of the fugitive Negro, it is page after page about this Ward. This is not, not some mister, some gentry, but the top echelons of the British aristocracy. And then I was in this house, and then they took me to the House of Commons. So to have the British confer all of this public support onto the black political class, that to me is, that's actually, they find that stage when the national stage is in many ways denied to them because of federalism and because of, of the power of the slaveholding class. As again, Don Fehrenbacher proved, it's a slaveholding republic. So they, they go around much like you know other you know, people of African descent later on. Uh, that's, my, that's my sense. That's my thought of it. Okay, well, uh, I think we've had a, we've, we've, yeah, we've, we've probably made a, a van stand up here enough, and it's time to pursue, pursue happiness. So let's thank you. Thank you.